All right. Welcome to your last lecture of content. Yay. Um, this is the lecture that covers a bunch of small topics that if you had another database course, like another full fat database course of this nature, depending which you guys are in computer programmer, right? You have another database course after this where they'll touch on some of these topics. If you were in CET, you wouldn't get another database course. So, you know, this is this this is actually for them more than for you guys. Um, but it's important that it covers the basics of this. Um, I know for a fact that transactions alone could be an entire lecture. Um, in actual fact, in university, uh, if you're, depending what course your courses you're taking, uh, they actually have an entire course just dedicated to transactions and all the magic math that happens inside of them. Uh, I am going to be covering them very lately in the simplest terms. But without further ado, let's dive into views. All right. A view, as I discussed last week, is a named query that's stored within the database. Essentially, it's the equivalent of a bookmark. Every time the view is called by its name, internally executes the query. Um, literally every single time it executes the entire query, it's always up to date. It's known as a dynamic view because it's constantly being updated. Um, a view allows you to hide the base table and only show parts of it. So um, years and years ago, when I worked for Compaq, before HP bought them, actually I was working for Digital, which bought by Compaq, but anyways, whatever. I was there for a bunch of acquisitions. Um, the, one of the divisions used a call track system called Remedy. And Remedy used views for everything. So you would design the application the way you want it to be. It would actually create views to abstract the, upside, the inner layer. So you can use a view as a way of taking a really complex query and storing it, or to hide the structure of the table from an application completely. So all they can see is the view. Um, it's often used in high security environments where you don't want all the information available to everybody all the time. Uh, stuff like credit cards or social security numbers. Uh, systems will actually switch which views they use depending on your permission levels. So to create a view in MySQL, same thing I did last week, uh, you go create or replace view, give it a name as, um, select columns from just a normal select statement after that. Uh, so or replace is a magic keyword where it allows you to redefine a view. Um, there's a few basic rules with the or replace. Um, historically, if you're replacing a view, it has to have the same number of columns as what was there before. If you want to say, go from four columns in your view to five columns being returned, you have to drop the view and recreate it. You can't replace it because you're changing the definition, the header. Um, so, or like as I actually was saying, or replace allows you to just update the structure. Uh, the name of the view is basically the name of whatever you want it to be. And then where is, you know, the SQL statement. Um, so a quick example, uh, there's a database that has a table called hospital. Uh, you want to create a view and uh, you're going to call it doctor. It'll create a virtual table, essentially. Um, the syntax would look like as follows. Create view doctor as select name, com name of hospital, comma doctor from hospital. And that would just give you, you know, a view. Yeah, I know. I heard them. Nine minutes, not bad. But it's only three. Um, and then if I were to take the previous view, um, and this example is actually wrong. It should be select star from doctor, not from hospital. How many more are coming? Are you sure about that? Um, so some databases, some database servers don't necessarily support the create or replace syntax. Instead, they'll use an alter view syntax. So MySQL is create or replace. Uh, Postgres is create or replace. Oracle is alter view. And you do an alter view, 
it just allows you to change the select statement that's inside of it. It's really not that much more complicated. Um, theoretically, MySQL will support alter view. Uh, I've seen it sometimes work and sometimes not, and I don't know why, which is I usually say use the create or replace because I know that one works all the time. Um, one of these days I'll dig into figuring out why alter view doesn't always work. Um, I just was having a really hard time finding the energy to care about why MySQL is being stupid again. Um, if you want to get rid of view, it's drop view if exists. If it exists, some of you may have already experienced this with the drop database if exists. Essentially, drop view, name of the view. If it doesn't exist, it gives you an error. Um, if it doesn't exist, it gives you an error. So if you include if exists, it says, hey, drop this if you can find it. If it doesn't exist, well, just don't tell me the fact you didn't find it. Let's pretend it never happened. Um, so there are two kinds of views. Dynamic views, which is what I showed you guys last week, which is basically a, a view that's stored every single time you call that view. It is the inner the inner view, let's call it. Um, the SQL statement inside the view will be run every single time, so it's fresh. It's always up to date, so that's dynamic. You have materialized views. Uh, each view has an advantage and unique purpose. Um, so a dynamic view is also known as a virtual table. Uh, some people call it a derived table. Sure, it's a virtual table, yes. Derived table is arguable. Um, the thing is, it doesn't like, occupy any extra room because all it's all literally it's all it's occupying is a space to store the query. Um, when you run it right away, it executes, refers to all the tables, uh, and obviously you can you know simplify a complex query. And any change you make to the table will result in changing the view. So if we have an underlying table called city and we change the structure, uh, we add an extra column and if the view is a select star, it'll show up in the view also. It'll always be up to date. Uh, if you add data to get out, it'll be you know refreshed. Um, draw view we already did, but materialized view. Now, here's where I put in a caveat. Um, Every good database server supports materialized views. Thirteen minutes. The other guys were faster than you. All right, materialized views. Every good database server supports materialized views. Guess what MySQL does not support? Materialized views. You can emulate materialized views, and I'll explain it in a little bit how you'd go around imitating it. Uh, but a materialized view is a persistent view. It's a data set that's created from tables, and it's actually stored. It, it, materialized views take space. Unlike a dynamic view, which has, doesn't have data of its own, a materialized view always has data of its own. Um, every time you run the materialized view, the result set that is stored is what is referenced, not the live data. So the data in the materialized view is only as fresh as the last time you refreshed it. Um, so the syntax would be like this. Um, create materialized view Canada MV as select star from city where country code, is equal, country code is equal to can. What that'll do is it'll take the results of that query, create a table, it's actually a view, but it's a table, shoves all the results of that query into that table, and it is static. It doesn't update. So you can add records, take records out of the city table to your heart's content. The materialized view will only ever have what you had when you created it. Um, there's a few reasons you want to use these. And I'm just going to go through a few of these other ones, uh, the rest of the slides before I explain why you'd want to use them. Uh, drop materialized view if exists. That drops the view. You can select from it just like a normal query. Um, so the biggest difference is, is that the dynamic one's always fresh. The materialized views go stale. It is stale the moment you create it. And people often ask me, well, what's the point of creating a materialized view? 
the purpose of a materialized view is to store computationally expensive queries for later. Um, one of the examples, like one of our systems at work uh, uses materialized views, uh, several views actually, um, to summarize sales data. And what it does is it refreshes every night when there's nobody using the system so that these expensive queries can run and not impact anybody's performance. The next day, when people are running reports for sales numbers, they don't care about the sales numbers since 9 a.m. They care about, you know, how it yesterday ended. The data is already summarized for them so that all this extra math that normally you do in the report is already done ahead of time. Um, it's used for data warehousing. Uh, the data, like these views do not have indexes. They don't have, you know, you can use them as a, as a uh, in joins and all that fun stuff, but that's kind of defeating the point of them. Uh, it is used for summarizing data. For example, Amazon has a lot of materialized views. Um, if you run a store in Amazon, which, you know, there's stores in Amazon, the people that run these stores have a dashboard. And on this dashboard, they can see their sales. And they can see today's sales. They can see yesterday's sales. They can also see sales trends. And the sales trends are coming from materialized views because can you imagine every time a guy or girl or whomever has a store on Amazon asks for the last year's worth of sales, if it actually ran that report on all of Amazon's data set, like that, that's insane. Like it would take forever to run. So they create materialized view that summarizes the data and you can create multiple views that summarizes the data differently. It allows reports to run really, really fast. Um, the only problem is it's always out of date. The moment you create it or the moment you refresh it, it's out of date because it's not getting anything else new until the next time you run the refresh job. But you know, you're you don't use it for what you need immediately, you use it for summarization of data. So um, this is just more what I just finished saying. Now, materialized views have um, two issues. It has to be updated or refreshed, and I'll discuss that in a second. Uh, data may be inconsistent with what is in live data. Of course, it's inconsistent. So the easiest way for me to summarize this for you guys is imagine you got a piece of paper with some writing on it. You photocopy it. There, it's your photocopy. Then you start writing on the piece of paper again. The piece of paper that you're writing on in the photocopy are no longer in sync because they're different. One is changing. Then the next day you say, okay, well, that's good. I can photocopy this one again. Now my view has been refreshed. Then I start writing on the old piece of paper again. It's out of date, but the view is now more up to date. Um, that's what they mean by it's inconsistent because the view does not automatically refresh. Um, so the syntax is refresh materialized view. So at least I made that one pretty straightforward to understand and remember. Uh, if you have a materialized view and you want to refresh the data in it, just you literally call command refresh. And what it will do is it looks at the stored query, just like it would be a normal view. It runs it, truncates the data that's already there, and then inserts the new data into it. And suddenly you've got a nice up-to-date snapshot. Um, like what are some of the perks? Uh, these are, um, if you were to delete a row, it would still it would show up in the dynamic view, but the materialized view wouldn't show it. Um, now, <clears throat> it is possible to create a view that is what they call an updatable view. An updatable view means that it's a a view that you can insert, update, and delete against. So. Remember earlier I was talking about how they use the system called Remedy? The, each of the views that it would create as you're designing the interface, and it was really weird. You had a blank form, and you literally drag and dropped fields onto it. And then when you save the form, it would create a view that would let you load that form. I have no idea why it was written like that, but that it was dynamically and easy to program. And I'm putting big air quotes around the easy to program part. It had its own programming language. Um, and 
what it would do is it would create all the views so they could be insert, update, and delete. If you want to make an updatable view, uh, there are two things uh, that are required. One, all the constraints have to be honored. By constraints, that means, does it have the primary keys? Is there foreign keys that are mandatory? Is that included in the view? So if you're including the primary key, you're including all the foreign keys while you're using a view. That's usually my take on it. Um, but if your data structure has changed underneath, that's why you'd change the view. You'd use a view. Um, the user has to have the same privileges on the view and on the underlying tables. So you have a view where the person can select from the view, but they don't have insert and update on the underlying tables. They'll never be able to do an insert and update. Even though they have full permissions on the view, it's like saying there's two doors. And you got your card, you tap the first door, you get in, go to the first door, you go to tap and the second door doesn't open because you're not allowed to get past the second door. That's basically what's happening with the view. You have to have permissions for both sets of objects or all the objects, I should say, uh, for it. Um, now, after refreshing, that's fine. That's just, I'm gonna talk about how you'd use views in MySQL. I just gotta sit, arthritis is bugging me today. So. When you're using views um, in MySQL and you want to create a materialized view, since it doesn't support a materialized view, can anybody take a guess how you'd get around it? It's really special. And it's not hard at all. It's just, can somebody in here think about how you get around creating a materialized view in something that doesn't support materialized views? Right. You create a table, and then you do a select, a, an insert into using a select statement. And suddenly you have a materialized view, except it's an actual table where you can actually look at the structure of the table and alter the structure of the table. Whereas with a materialized view, you can't. But if you've populated the table, it's static until you repopulate the table. It's just, instead of typing in refresh materialized view, whatever, you'd go truncate table ABC, insert into table ABC as per the select statement. And you would have to always have the select statement that would be doing the view in place. You always have to remember to truncate the table. There's extra steps before and after. Um, I've seen some people get away with, they created a normal view and they use the normal view to populate the table. So they go select, insert into table, as select star from the view and magically it went in. So they didn't, they never needed to remember the view structure, but you still have to do the stupid insert manually. So it's extra steps, um, but that's how you do a materialized view in MySQL. Um, personally, I've found that true materialized views tend to behave a little faster uh, on the rebuild than the truncate insert approach. Uh, I have no idea why, but historically I've noticed that it seems to be about 10% faster in database servers that support it. Uh, maybe because it doesn't need to think about what the query is because it already knows about the query. I don't know. Okay, right. now I'm going to talk about indexes. Indexes. A lot of queries often only need a bit of data from a database at a time. Rarely will it do a select star from table with no where clause. You just want everything from the table. Uh, that's not really usually how you do it. You, you do a very specific queries. You select with where clauses to pull limited data, limited columns. Um, now, if the, imagine if the only way you could get data is if you search the entire database every single time. So you want to find all the Janes in a given table. So you've got a column first name, Jane bunch of Janes in there and you're trying to find it. Imagine if the only way you could find the Janes is you went row one is the first name Jane. Row two is the first name Jane. Row one million is the first name Jane. Um, it could take a while. It's really inefficient. And somewhere along the way, somebody said, you know, we really got to come up with a better way of doing this because that's literally how it used to work. Uh, so they created something called indexes. It speeds up the queries, so you don't have to search the entire database. When you start doing a search with an index, um, 
So if you do a search against a table, what happens is the query optimizer, so this thing that interprets your command, will look at the table structure and see if there's an index. Then it looks at the structure of the index and says, oh, they're looking for first names. Do I have an index that has to do with first names? Yes. Good, let's use that. And then it speeds up the search because it's optimized for searching through that name. Uh, if there's no index, it won't use it. If it's an invalid index for it, as in you're searching for only one field, but there's two fields in the index, it won't use that index. You're searching for two fields, but there's only uh, there's an index with only one field. It might use that one if it applies. Um, like I said, the indexes can be a, a, like a complex topic, like days worth of lecture. Uh, we're just doing the basics. Um, so you know how when you have a textbook and you're trying to find a topic in your textbook, you just, what's the fastest way to find it? Is you flip to the back, look through the index, it gives you the page number. You flip open to the page number, then you only need to look through that page to find the topic, right? Instead of having to go through from page one to page 50, you know, 79, you go to the back, you find out oh, this is on page 79, then you only have to scan page 79 for your topic. That's basically what an index does in the database. Um, the index stores an optimized hash, I guess you could call it, of the data with the location in the table. Uh, and then the search is a little bit quicker from there. Um, so an index is, it's not a table, it's a data structure that's used to determine where in the table data is uh, located. Primary keys are always indexed. Second you create a primary key, that field will be indexed. You don't have to worry about indexing it, it will be indexed. Other fields and combinations of other fields might be indexed. Uh, usually you want to index um, fields that are searched on often. So you have a customer table. You probably would want to index email addresses, phone numbers, maybe postal codes, um, customer number. If it's Let's say they have a customer number, but it's not the primary key. Things that people would search on regularly you would index. Um, you would also put indexes on foreign keys because foreign keys usually don't get indexed automatically. You create a foreign key, it's being enforced like it's a constraint, but it is not being indexed. That means joins will be slow until you create the index. Take it as someone who's learned that one the hard way. Because um, it's not the same in all database servers. Um, when I went through school, our Oracle database server that we were learning SQL on had the option to automatically index foreign keys. I thought that's how it was everywhere because they never told us that's not how it is. So at my current job, we have a very some very complex tables that have grown dramatically over the years. And suddenly right out of nowhere, one of the queries that used to run in you know second, second and a half was taking five minutes. We're like, something's borked. Go, well, let's go digging. And we're noticing that this one query is really, really slow. So then I start looking and then I notice there's no indexes on any of the foreign keys. I add indexes on the foreign keys. The query went from five minutes to four, uh, was it a uh, quarter second to run? It was even faster than it was before. It went sideways. So fields you search for often get indexed. Foreign keys, probably want to index those because it's just gonna make things go a little faster, especially if you're doing a lot of joins. The more joins, the better it should be. Um, these are known as secondary keys, uh, often known as non-unique keys, although you can create a unique index, uh, such as create a unique index on a email address so that you can never put the same email address in the system twice. Um, but that's, you know, it is what it is. All right, so the most common index type is known as the B plus tree, the B tree index. And I used to think it stood for binary tree. And then I was doing some research for this course because I was updating some slides before all this stuff got rewritten again. I discovered that I was wrong all those years. I called it the you know, binary tree, Dan's right, no, Dan's wrong. B plus tree stands for best tree, literally best tree. It's just that, the, yeah, so a B tree is actually best tree. I felt stupid after I read that. 
I don't know if I felt stupid because it was stupid that it was called best tree or I felt stupid because it, I just assumed it was binary tree because that's literally what it is. It's a binary tree, but it's the best tree. All right. So the way a B tree works is it will have four la layers, but it will have hundreds of branches. So let's just say you have values that go from A to Z. Layer the at the very top, it'll be everything will be A to Z, and then it'll take the data and divide it in two, so A to M, N to Z. It'll take that first one, divide that in half, and divide that in half again, and I'll give you your four layers. The thing is that the more data you have, instead of being you know half and half, it might go from one to four, four to sixteen, sixteen to 64 kind of thing, depending on the needs of how much data you have. Um, and so the way it would work at that point is it would go, is the, in this case, names, is the name, the first letter of the name less than M? Yes. Okay. We're going to go into that leaf. Is it less than G? Yes. Let's go into that leaf. Is it less than C? Oh, it must be A or B now. So then it's just, just needs to search through A and Bs instead of the whole and the index will store all these values sorted so that it knows where things are and how to get them. Um, so it's an interesting way of working. It basically the same system as how you can guess a number between one and 10, right? Because you can always get the number in three and four guesses, no matter what, between one and 10. Because you go, okay, well, give me a number between one and 10. Your first guess is five, higher or lower. Then it'll be three or seven, higher or lower. Two, no, that's one. And that's literally how the B tree works. There's a lot of math. What they call relational math in this. Uh, this is the layman's approach to the whole index. And to be completely honest, that's all I've ever needed to know about it. I've been doing this for 26, 27 years. That's all I ever needed to know. Um, there are other kinds of indexes that are slightly more efficient for different kinds of data. Uh, then the B tree. Um, but those are very specific and you have to research how it behaves. Uh, for example, Postgres also, also offers a heuristic tree, an H tree, and it uses some sort of weird logic to decide where to put things in the index. Uh, there's a hash tree, not a hash tree, a hash index where it stores key value pairs. That's all it has is key value pairs for everything. Um, this is actually literally the example I just did. Um, if we were looking for flyers, they would look, you know, first range ends at F, second range ends at P, last range ends at Z. Is it greater or equal to F? Yes. Okay. It's going to go to the first branch to the left. Then is it greater than B? No, less than B? No, less than D? No, less than F or equal to F? Yes. It'll drop in and grab that value. So. How do you create indexes? Uh, you can create unique indexes. They're also known as primary indexes, but you can also use another fields. Obviously, you can do it with an e email address is a very popular one to make unique because you don't want duplicate email addresses in your system if you can avoid it because that's problematic. Um, so the syntax is what's at the bottom of that slide. You go create unique index, give it a name on the name of the table, parentheses, the applicable field. And if it's not unique, you just don't include the unique keyword. So it's create index, whatever it is, on the product, underscore T, description, and that would create that index. Now, one of the little things that really not covered all that much in this is that you can create indexes on multiple fields at once, and you just include them comma delimited. So you'd have description comma something else, and that would be a two column index. Um, so I, there's a few, there's another example, create an index. So create an index, name index on person name. And this is create a multiple column one. So if you go create index, they call the double index in this example on person and age and city. This index will help if you're querying both of those fields. So select star from person where age is equal to 55 and city is equal to Seattle. It'll work for that one. But if you do select star from person where city is equal to Seattle, the index will not work for that because the query optimizer will look at the index that fits the best. And if an index has multiple columns, 
it's not suitable for single column lookups. So you'd actually have to create a second index with a single column in it. Um, there's catches to that too. So before I get into transactions, one of the catches of indexes is, look, there's a few catches when it comes to indexes. Um, as beneficial as they can be because they speed up your queries, uh, they make lookups faster, uh, the, you know, in general, your queries run better. Um, there's a few catches. One, they take up room. Obviously. You have an index. It sorts the data and places it somewhere. It's got to be stored somewhere. It's not going to rebuild the index every single time you restart the database server. So it's stored on disk somewhere. Um, I don't think anybody here is old enough to remember card files. Do you remember card files? Anybody in here? Go into the library. They had the little, they open a little drawer and there's all these, she's nodding. So that was my punishment when I was in school. Every time I got in trouble, they made me go type up the index cards for the library. That was my, that was how they punished me. And the way you work is you'd have like one that was by topic, one was by author, one was by something else. And these are like different indexes for the library. So you'd go open up the drawer and you go, oh, I'm looking for author that starts with I. And you'd go through the index, find the ones that start with I, then you go alphabetically looking for. And then it would say, okay, all this, all this guy's books are on shelf, you know, 52, whatever. That's exactly what the index does. Those card files take up room. Indexes take up room also. Um, indexes also add, if you have too many indexes, you can cause the query optimizer to get confused. So let's say you have a single column index, a multi-column index, and then another multi-column index, and they just so happen to overlap what their content is. And then you go to run a query, it might confuse, get confused as to which query, I mean, which index it should use. And if it's too confused, do you know what it's gonna do? As I say, no, I'm not gonna use any of these. Row one is the name Jane. Row two is the name Jane. It stops using indexes. If it can't choose, it will not use the index. Fun times. Uh, three, indexes add IO operations. So input output operations. We're gonna go insert a row into a table. And we happen to have eight indexes on this table. We are gonna insert the row in the table. So operation one, writes the row to the disk. Operation two, read index number one. Figure out where it needs to put the new data, insert the data, write that to the disk. Index number two, do the same thing. So for every index you add, you can add, uh, if I remember, somebody told me years ago exactly what it was, uh, six to eight different disk operations for every index. So if you have eight indexes, you're inserting one row. Let's go with six. Eight times six is plus one. The original insert. Just because you want to add one row, you're going to have, because you have all those indexes, it's going to, have, it's going to hit that disk that many times. So it slows everything down because it has to work to save the data. Uh, so that is some of the hidden costs that are in the slides. You're not going to be asked this, in this on the exam because it's not in the slides. But when you're creating indexes, it's important to be aware that there's costs. Nothing comes for free. Uh, that's something we should all know by now is nothing comes for free. Um, all right. Now, transactions. Transactions is an interesting topic. Um, because, let's go see what they've got in the slides here. All right. So a transaction is an interesting topic because it is something that the financial world would not be able to exist without. A transaction is a unit of work that changes the state of a database. Cool. So you do a single insert statement. That's a transaction. But what happens if you need to do multiple steps and they all have to succeed for it to be considered a proper transaction? A good example is transferring money at the bank. 
if you, anybody here work in a bank? And my other group actually has student, two students that work in a bank, and one of them actually understood what I was talking about. Anybody here work in a bank? Ever? No. Okay. Everybody here has got a bank account, right? How many of you have more than one bank account? Yeah, probably most of us. You know, we've got a checking and the, this is the money I can't spend if I don't want to starve next week account, right? <laughs> She's laughing. I went through college, trust me. There was a whole lot of time where I was eating a lot of hot dogs. Because that's the only thing I could, not even no buns, just hot dogs. Money was tight. <laughs> craft dinner was like, it was a luxury. And then today it's expensive, but back then it was cheap. Like, buck craft dinner was like 30 cents. And I had to decide if I wanted for buns or if I wanted craft dinner. So, all right. So, multiple accounts. And um, when you transfer money from one account to the other, there's a couple of steps. People don't realize that there's multiple steps. And different banks do this differently, but in the end, they do all the same steps. It's just the order they do it in is slightly different. Um, see if I got my markers. And then I'm going to read the slides to you guys. I'd rather explain what the transaction does and then just read the slides. Holy cow, let me, handwriting's terrible. Okay. We got a bank account A, B. A has $500 in it. B has $200 in it. Cool. See, I'm using realistic numbers that students understand. I need to transfer $100 from A to B. How would you do it? Anybody do you want to take a guess how that happens? Yes, like dual entry accounting. Anybody who's ever done accounting, it's the exact same thing. So the bank will do minus 100 here. We're up to $400. Then we're going to add $100 here, and we'll have $300. You'll notice that the number 100 appears twice. Now, if we didn't have a transaction and the plus 100 failed, you suddenly be $100 poorer, and you wouldn't have your money here. Um, some banks do it the other way around, where they'll add the $100 here and then take the $100 out, because they'd rather risk giving you a little extra money than losing money. Uh, so what happens is they use something called a transaction. Basically, it'll mark this as a starting point, mark that as an end point, where the database will be stable after it's finished. Everything else that's happening in here is contained in something called this transaction, which will now lead me to explaining the slides. It's, it's basically a sequential group of statements that should be performed as a single unit of work. In other words, I want to transfer $100 from A to B. Realistically, the fact that I'm removing $100 from one and adding $100 to another both of those have to happen to be considered a valid transaction. If either of those fail, it's not a valid transaction. So if it succeeds and gets to the end, usually it'll be something called commit will happen. A commit, the transaction will be committed. When it's committed, it is saved to the disk. It's permanent. If something goes wrong, it does what's called a rollback, and it pretends that none of this happened, and it brings us back to this state here. So, the point of the transaction is to make sure that the database is in a stable condition before and after. It's consistent before and after. It won't be the same data before and after, but essentially everything that happened in between is applied. And MySQL transactions will end explicitly when you issue either commit or rollback command. We'll be talking about those in a minute. Um, they will end implicitly when they encounter a DDL statement. So you have an insert, update, insert, update, delete, insert, update, all part of your thing, and suddenly you do alter table. MySQL will go at that point and go, bruh, you're in the middle of a transaction. Good enough. Let's commit. Or let's roll back and not tell you we rolled back. So it could be both. 
Um, it depends. If I remember right, one version did one thing, and the next version did something different. And I think they gave us a switch somewhere to choose how it behaves. Um, so when we talk about uh, transactions, there's an acronym to help us remember everything. It's called ACID. And the ACID acronym stands for uh, Atomic, Consistent, Isolated, and Durable. So A stands for atomic. It means that every statement within the group is required to perform successfully. In other words, all these steps here are all considered a single operation. Therefore, all of these have to work. Otherwise, it's considered to be failed. Therefore, this is a single unit of work. Therefore, it's atomic unto itself. There could be like 25 commands in here. But if it's all part of the same transaction, it's considered one unit of work. Therefore, it's it's atomic. It can't be divided. We all know what happens when you divide in an atom, right? So, so it can't be divided. Therefore, it's atomic. It says all or nothing. In other words, it has to happen. Consistent. Uh, sometimes it's also called known as consistency. The characteristic, this characteristic refers to the fact that the state of the database is modified when a transaction is committed successfully. So in other words, we start out with 500 and 200. A bunch of stuff happens in the middle during the transaction. And then we commit. These pieces of information go in. The results of this will be consistent to whatever was asked to happen. So for example, if we took out 100, but fail to add the 100, the database would be inconsistent because we started out with 700 and we ended with 700. If we started with 700 and ended up with 600, that's inconsistent. Unless, of course, obviously you're doing withdrawal, but in this case, you're doing a transfer. It just depends what you're doing. Isolation. Isolation is cool. Isolation means that whatever is happening in the transaction is not visible outside of the transaction until it finishes. I'll actually be doing a demo of this once I'm done talking about transactions. It'll make way more sense when you actually see it happening. Um, it means that the statements are transparent to each other. While this is happening, other stuff could be happening to these accounts. The other stuff doesn't even know that this transaction is happening. Durability. When it's finished and it's committed, it gets written to the disk, it can't be undone. That's what it means. That's durability. Uh, essentially, it means that uh, when it's successfully ex executed, they're kept, even if there's system failure, crash, server reboot, whatever, power outage, it's all good. Okay. So the start transaction statement is used to start the transaction. Um, often we use another one called begin uh, because it's less words to type. Uh, start transaction is not universal. Begin is universal. Begin works in all database servers, so it's all good. Um, as you can see in the second bullet point, begin or begin work. Um, commit is used to commit the transaction. That means it's going to make the data change durable, permanently applied. Rollback means you're going to undo whatever you did. It cancels. Um, set auto commit is used in MySQL specific. Uh, you can turn off auto commit. So you know right now when you run a single statement in MySQL in the command prompt in the you know your editor, you go insert into whatever and you hit run. It's committed right away because auto commit is turned on. Um, most database servers have auto commit turned on by default, except for Oracle. Oracle has auto commit turned off by default, and you have to turn it on for every connection. It's just that's how Oracle works. It's cool. As long as you know that's how it works, it's all good. Um, uh, there's save points. Uh, it's used to create uh, markers. So you can do step one, step two, mark a save point. Step three, step four, do a step a save point. Step five, step six, and realize that step five or step six failed. You can roll back to a save point. It not only undoes part of the transaction, and then in theory you could commit what whatever else happened before that. So then you can just say, hey. Uh, I was able to transfer the money, but I couldn't insert something into the log to say the money was transferred. So maybe inserting into the log is not as important as the actual transfer. Um, 
So usually the save point, unless you name it, uh, the rollback will always go back to the most recent save point. Um, yeah, so this is just talking about the save points and stuff like that. I don't remember any of these questions on the exam. That's why I'm kind of skimming over them. So you create a save point by giving it a name. You can roll back to a specific save point. You can choose to release a save point. So you can say, hey, I did task one, task two, save point, task three, task four, save point. At that point, I can say, hey, I don't need save point more anymore. So let's release save point one. So that we, it's like, uh, how many of you play video games and use a quick save? Quick save, quick save, quick save. Every time you do a quick save, you lose the other quick save, right? Save point. Same idea. Uh, it allows you to just go back to the most recent spot you've considered was safe. Um, again, in 27 years, I've never used a save point. Maybe I just don't work with the right kind of data. Right? So I'm not saying it's not. You, obviously, people use it. Otherwise, they wouldn't add it to the database server. I just never used it. I'll just be honest. Okay. So I wanted to do the demo on that. Really quick. Close that. Close that. I want to go to uh, this, ta this database. Okay, if I remember right, this is gonna be very similar to one to your last lab. If I remember it, lab 10 is about transactions. Uh, this is basically gonna show you how to do the lab. Lab 10 is published. 10 is alive. It, it's, it's a gimme lab. Like nine is here, 10 is here. It 10 is easy. I made sure 10 was easy. Okay. So you will notice what I just did is I created one connection. I went back and I created a second connection. So you'll notice I have two tabs open. And in here, you I have a single table. And I'm going to go select star from trans demo. And I'm going to run it. So see, we've got a bunch of names in here, okay? ID starts at four, bunch of names. Cool. I am going to go to my second tab and I'm going to run the exact same command. We're talking to the same database, so the data looks the same. Okay. Nothing magical so far. Here's where things get fancy. So I'm going to go uh, begin. And I'm going to go insert into trans demo. And we're going to go with just the name column. And we are going to add in the value of Bob. Because we don't have Bob in here yet. Okay. Select star from trans demo. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to hit run. Bob exists. Transaction has been begun, but it has not been committed or rolled back. So now I'll go to my other tab. I'm going to do select star. Bob does not exist. Remember I was talking about ACID? This is the I in ACID, isolation. This connection doesn't know what's happening in this connection. And because it's in a transaction, it's invisible to the second connection until I go and do I fire off a commit. And now I can go to my other tab and I run it. And now Bob is there because I committed it. It's now available to everybody else. So if I were to come back over here and I start my transaction again, and this time I'm going to add Bill. Run this again. Okay, so we know Bill is there. Bill is still not there. If I do a rollback, And I run the rollback and I go select star from trans demo. I go go. The rollback undid my change. So the second tab never even saw Bill. First tab had Bill until I said, you know what? I don't want Bill here. 
So I rolled back the transaction. Bill was forgotten. Um, now, here's something that's kind of nifty. Um, my students in the other section after you guys, they just they had the transaction lecture like two weeks ago. And one of them asked me a question nobody's ever asked. What happens if I start a transaction and, well, I know what happens, but nobody asked me to demo this. The, here's what's nifty. So I'm going to do the exact same thing I did. I'm going to insert bill again. Transaction is doing its thing. Cool. If I come back over here, we don't see bill. But let's just say we want to get rid of Francine. And we go run. Only one row affected. Fantastic. Now, if I were to go do an insert into my, like this, and I go run, why is this working today? Hello? Let's try that again. Run. Well, here's Bill, Dave, and Bill. What the heck did I do last time? Oh, okay. Let's go. Let's do. Um, delete from trans demo where ID is equal to nine. All right. So we're going to fire Jane. We're going to run the whole thing as a transaction. Go. Okay. We see Jane is gone. Right now we can see, hello, select star from trans demo. Okay, see Jane is still here. I'm gonna go update trans demo, set name equal to Alice, where ID is equal to nine. So right now I'm trying to actually change a record that's in the middle of a transaction. I'm going to hit run. Notice right now it just says running. It's not actually doing anything. What it's actually doing is it's waiting for this to commit. So if I were to do a commit, I go commit here. This will be my commit for my delete. It's done. I come over here and I'll say zero rows affected, zero rows matched. Because we deleted it during the transaction, this one tried to do something to it while the transaction was running. It's saying, hey, you can't play with this until I'm done playing with this. Then it deleted it. Then it says, okay, you can try to do your command now. And the record wasn't even there, so it couldn't do anything to it. Um, we can turn that around and do the exact same example. But this time we're going to do it to ID 10. And we're going to run all of this. Cool. So I uh, 10 become Alice. Um, I do select star from trans demo. You'll see 10 is still Yuri. So if I go 10, Alice had a uh, change of heart and she decided to become Frank. You'll see this is also running, even though we didn't delete the other record, the other record's just holding in place. If I were to, instead of doing commit here and I did a rollback, and I do the good old um, you'll see that 10 became frank because once the lock on the row was released from the transaction, the other one was able to finish doing its job. So if I go back to this tab, you'll see that it actually did do it. Now, what's kind of fun about this situation too is, let's say they're both doing an update, transaction finishes, the next one does its thing. So we just go back to here with our example, we go undo, undo, and we're gonna go, uh, Going to do Franklin like this, and this one will be uh, decided to go back to being Alice. Come back to my first tab, run the whole thing. It puts a hold on the record. You know it's running. 
So we come here and we do a commit. Oh, no. Commit. And if we select star from trans demo, you'll see Alice changed. Even though both were doing an update, the last one wins because it wasn't in a transaction. Uh, what happens if you begin a transaction in both? I could open a third tab and just make this more complicated. But in theory, it, it would go in the order of which transaction started first. So it would be transaction one committed, transaction two committed, last one released. That's the theory. Um, so this little demo I just did shows you guys the isolation part, the consistency, because the database stays consistent until the transaction is done. It's durable because once it's done, it's done. And it's atomic, even though in this case I was doing single, you know, single step transactions, but they're atomic. It's considered it has to be all or nothing. Okay, so that is officially the last of the material for the term. That was it, folks. Um, I will be, next week will be very quick. I'll be coming in and doing a quick summary of what you can find on the exam. I'm waiting for the final copy of the exam. I've seen the draft. It's not terrible. 50. 50, multiple guess, Scantron, just like the midterm. It's literally the same, same format as the midterm. So it's all good. Except you don't get to sit in rows like this. You're going to be sitting in long rows in the gym. In the gym. There's three, oh, there's like 250 of you guys writing this test this in two weeks. There's three other lecture sections. Two or three. This is the small group. Just so you know, you're going to be writing it with everybody else that has 8215 this semester. Not just, so this whole sitting at the back having a conversation during the test is not going to work. Just because I don't speak the language doesn't mean I don't know you're to talk about the answers. I'm not stupid. Just because I don't understand what you're saying doesn't mean I'm stupid. Um, so. It is going to be in the gym. Do you guys know where the gym is? It's next to the Tim Hortons. In A building. Where do they play basketball? There we go. This is the first group I've ever said where they play basketball. They all go, yeah. Usually it's like, what's a ball? I sit in my basement. I play video games. I've had entire groups that were like that. like That have never seen the sunlight in their life. Uh -huh. um, so... What I'm going to do next week is a bit like I did with the midterm. I'll come in, tell you guys this, the breakdown of the questions roughly per week of material. Um, you have my recorded lectures, so, you know, a big formal review is not ideal. Um, now, I did have one person ask me, you know, can I spend a few minutes talking about joins one more time before I, you know, send everybody off? So if you don't care to have a quick review on how joins work, you're free to run. If you want to just rewatch it really quickly, you're welcome to sit. And I'm going to give you guys the chance. So the chronically late crew, you know, if you want to leave early, it'll match <laughs> the behavior. Okay. I am going to go back to my flight DB database and So this is nothing new. Select star from airports. It's something you guys have seen before. Um, I'm going to simplify this. I'm just going to go. I want the name and the city of the airport. And I'm going to throw in the country ID. Because we don't know the name of the country in the airports table. So a join is when you're trying to pull data from more than one table at once. and when you do a join is you will um, use the join syntax. And in this case, I'm going to join countries on All right, so 
The way the join works is you go from table A, join table B, then you feed it the on clause. If you don't include the on clause, you're doing a Cartesian join where you're literally joining everything to everything else. It's a pointless query. The on clause says in this table, this column is equal to the value in this other table. So in this case, countries is the parent table. Airports is the child table. So the primary key of countries, which is ID, is equal to the country ID in airports, which is the foreign key. And then when I run this, I will get an error because it's saying the name is ambiguous because the column called name already exists in more than one place. So if you want to use a column that's used multiple times, you have to prefix it with the table name. Uh, dot name. Now I do this. Now magically it's back. So now I could in here, so far I'm still pulling only from the airports table. I'm not going to do countries dot name. I'm going to give an alias as country. And now I am retrieving the name of the country via the foreign key in airports. So now I know the name of the city, um, the name of the airport, and the country it's in. Does that clarify how you do a join a bit? A little bit? There is no limit how many joins you can do, theoretically. As those of you who have experienced Lab 9, uh, did you enjoy Lab 9? Did you suffer? Because I try to make sure you suffered. The last two questions, yes. Uh, you're lucky you actually got the proper subquery uh, lecture. Uh, the other groups, they didn't learn about using subqueries as a derived table. So I've had my other group, my my Thursday lab has a different lecture, and they're like, we don't understand what this question is asking. I'm like, let me demonstrate this for you. And by the way, if you want to learn this, here's my record. Here's the link on YouTube. This minute to this minute <laughs> is what you need to know. Um, yeah, there's a couple of ways of doing the last two questions. But you realize that question eight, you literally joined every table in the database to every other table. And it's just showing that literally you can join everything to everything else. It makes no difference. As long as you're doing valid joins, as in you're joining across proper foreign keys, it's going to work. Like I can add to this. Now I can go uh, join roots on roots dot source airport underscore ID uh, is equal to airports dot ID join aircraft. It's a root aircraft, right? There it is on root aircrafts dot root ID is equal to roots dot ID join aircrafts on aircrafts.id is equal to root aircrafts dot aircraft id and it's not aircraft it's aircrafts and uh now i could theoretically go uh aircrafts dot name comma aircrafts dot description comma root ID and there it is. So it shows which aircraft and aircraft type tied to a given route going to taking off from what airport. I think that's pretty much the answer to question number eight. Or oh, very close to the answer to number eight. And people are gonna take pictures, they're like, click, there's number eight. But this is literally demonstrating to you that it is not, like a join only seems complicated until you understand how to do the first one. The The biggest catch with joins that a lot of people forget is you cannot join to a table that's not already in the list. So you have to remember, remember I talked about how this goes from left to right? So this is left, and if I hold down my cursor, my cursor is moving right, correct? So everything to the left of the cursor is left, everything to the right of the cursor is right. So that means if you're trying to join a table, let's go try to join this one here. 
we're trying to join uh, root aircraft without having roots ahead of it. And I try to run it. I get an error code saying, hey, roots ID is unknown because it hasn't read the roots table yet. Therefore, it has been joined in. So you're going to get an error. So the order of the tables is important. And I'm sure some of you have experienced this. Um, now I run it again. And my poor laptop, when it's recording, it's like, like it really doesn't like running these queries. Like my laptop's actually, you could burn yourself on it right now. No, I'm not kidding. Like this is probably close to 65, 70 degrees. Yeah, it's it's not having a good time. Um, so that's just demonstrating that, yeah, you can do multiple joins at once. The order of the join is important. As in, you can't join to a table that's not already in the list. That's all. Often for this particular query, most people would start a lot of people would start using from roots and then doing the joins from there because roots like basically the middle table, right? It's connected to everything else. So if you start at roots, you have a really good chance to make sure you're not missing anything because it, it covers all the things. Do you have a question? Because I saw your hand kind of flap. Yeah. No, that was just the implicit joins. And I spoke about clearly about how those have are no longer they work but they're not considered proper anymore they're there for legacy those are known as implicit joins um explicit joins have specific uh, benefits uh they tend to be more performant uh the database server is more aware that you're actually trying to do a join so it optimizes the retrieval of the records better um it's easier to do a left and a right join which the implicit joins is really, really hard. I can show you guys how we would have done it in Oracle. Um, all right, and I'm gonna take the aircraft stuff out. And if I run this, it works just like it did before, right? So that's the version you saw. Now, let's say I wanted to do a left join. Before we had the full join syntax like we have now, what we've had to do in Oracle is this. That's a left join in Oracle. Do you see what I just put in? This is a right join. This is an equi join. So now, imagine you're reading a really long SQL statement and you miss the asterisk. You wouldn't even realize you're doing a left join. Thus, the explicit format of left join or left outer join, if you want to include the outer word, left join, right join, full join, inner join, just join on, makes it much more explicit as to what, you, what you're doing. Even though it's more wordy, because there's obviously more syntax happening, the syntax is, let me just go back to what I had originally here. So much clearer what's happening than with an implicit join. Because you know you're doing a join. Because you put in the word join. Up till then, you know, with the other one, the other one, you could just put the comma countries. And I'm sure some people have done this too. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Doo -doo -doo. Boom. That only took one and a half seconds. Uh, I just joined every country to every airport and every airport to every country. Uh, it returned uh, 1,945,680 rows. Uh, the only reason it took that long is because I put in no don't limit. Like at the top, you'll notice the, the, the drop down says don't limit. So it returned, you know, nearly 2 million rows because you joined every airport to every other airport. So it's one of the reasons why explicit joins aren't so great because it's easy to make this kind of mistake. Okay. That cover your question about joins? Fantastic. All right. So once again, next week, it's going to be quick. I'm going to come in, go over what's on the test. Uh, confirm with you guys the time. It's 9 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, I think this is your last exam.
Normally, it's your first exam. It's the first time we're the last exam. You're going to be so tired. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so, 9 a.m. on Saturday. Um, as usual, it's a Scantron test. You're going to come in with pencils and erasers. Um, yes, you can bring water. Um, some of the profs get really anal retentive about what you take your water in. They don't like non-transparent vessels. Pink bottle, cool. We can see inside of it. Pink, red, whatever color that is, fuchsia, that's cool. This, not cool. Why? Because I've we've seen cases where people literally were going. No, I, I've seen it. Like I caught someone doing it. I wish I was joking. Like there's, so we've seen so many ways people try to cheat that it's not funny. That where you know, if you're gonna bring in water, bring it in a clear container. Uh, if it's coffee, we're probably gonna ask you to take the lid off, which is dangerous for your test. Because that way, at least we know we can look in your cup when we're patrolling. Because we're going to be patrolling. Like, there'll be a few props. Like, LM will be there. He'll be doing laps up and down. We're going to be running answering questions. So, you know, we're going to be going to answer questions. And we're going to be looking at people's stuff on the way by. You're like, okay. Um, I do recommend you bring the bare minimum of things with you. Because you're going to... Normally, we say to keep the bags under your desk. I'm not in charge of the exam, so I'm not sure what the rule's going to be yet. Sometimes the bags have to be at the front. Which, if you have all your stuff up front, we don't know whose bag is whose bag. That has happened, where somebody grabbed a bag they thought was theirs. And they left for somebody else's bag. I mean, how many of you in here have the exact same backpack? Actually, so far it's been pretty cool. There's a lot of variety in the backpacks, but, you know, you got three, you got... A couple hundred people, it's a good chance at least two people have the same backpack. It's happened where somebody grabbed the wrong backpack. We got lucky because they went out into the hall, they opened the backpack, came right back in, put it down. And we looked at him, What are you doing? He goes, That's not mine. <laughs> that one's mine. And then they left. Um, so, you know, try just bring what the minimum you need into the gym. So. All right, outside of that, you guys are done. Free run. You have a question. Okay. Now, let me just pull open lab 10 so you can see what's involved. Since you asked. Considering it showed up on the calendar as due, but nobody bought it. Activities, uh, assignments. Let's go look at content. Uh, lab. Ten. Um, so you're going to create. Two indexes, you're going to create a view. That's, you know, five minutes. Um, the last one is literally the example I just did with the transactions. You open two connections, you're going to start a transaction, you're going to insert, you're going to count the rows, you're going to count the rows in the other tab. That's what that lab is. It's visible now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'll, they'll do it for now, but I'll probably get in trouble. So, well, I, technically, I'm giving you guys a due date later in the other courses, the other groups. So, or, I don't. Tell me about it. You, you, you speak, it sounds like I've been doing this for 17 years, witnessing everybody dying. It's actually, I'm going to give you guys the extra time because it's on me because I forgot to turn it on. But realistically, you didn't even have the lecture until today for it. But it's your last lap. So, yeah, I, I whatever. 
I'll just warn the other guys that I forgot to turn on the lab, so I'll give you guys extra time. Yeah. Next week. They're due before the final exam. Oh, no, no, they're not. Slides only. It's all good.